Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Hope all of you are safe out there with COVID going around and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of mass panic in some areas and, you know, it's just a trying time for all of us for a lot of different reasons. Um, and stress is playing a big role tonight. And so what I wanna continue to do over the next several weeks and, and even potentially longer is to continue to bring you support around this topic. And so tonight, what I wanted to talk about is the fever reducing medications because there was a big uh, play about a week and a half ago where the French uh, head of the head minister, minister the uh, the French minister came out and reported that nobody should be taking um, in, non steroidal anti inflammatories or NSAIDs to reduce fevers. So we're going to be talking a little bit about fever reduction and why this whole thing is playing out the way it does. Because I've talked a couple of weeks ago about if you got to a certain point where you could potentially use something to reduce a fever if you absolutely needed to, and then all this information came out and lots of people were scared and nervous about what they should be doing. So again, let's talk about what actually happened. So again, the, the French health minister came out because there were some early reports saying that NSAIDs are a bad idea. Uh, and one of the reasons why now, again, if you're not familiar with what an NSAID is, it's medicines like ibuprofen and even aspirin's an NSAID. Naproxen is an NSAID and domethacin is an NSAID. So again, it's a drug class that blocks infl inflammation uh, to, in, 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 in essence, is an antipyretic. It blocks the fever from occurring. And so again, what they were seeing or what they were speculating is because this class of medications actually increases um, the quantity of a type of, of special receptor on the cell. So, so that receptor is called an ACE2 receptor. ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. Look, we're not going to get deep and heavy into all this chemistry stuff. I don't want to bore you off the show tonight. I want you to just kind of follow me here. Increasing the ACE2 receptor. And why is this a problem? Because the ACE2 receptor, if we look at a human cell, the ACE2 receptor sits on the surface of the cell. And this is how COVID-19, or really not COVID-19, COVID-19 is the name of the disease, but this is how the uh, SARS virus, the, the coronavirus, we'll just abbreviate it, CV, this is how it attaches and gets into your cell and then gets to your DNA and can start to replicate itself. So because these medications increased the quantity of this type of receptor, it was speculated that it made more of these receptors available for the virus to penetrate into your cell and hijack your cell, creating increased replication for itself and more symptomatic problems in a more aggressive case of the, of the virus. Now, this was all based on preliminary, uh, preliminary observation. So let's, I'm gonna put up a slide for you if you wanna look at, at, at this first slide. So let's look at, at um, what the WHO is actually saying. Because originally the WHO came out and said, no, don't take NSAIDs. And then they came out and said, no, NSAIDs are okay. And so everybody in the world was really, really confused for a while. So as, as of March 18th, so again, this is as current as, as we can be as this thing moves, right? Uh, the, the actual official position of the World Health Organization is that ibuprofen is perfectly fine if you are, are taking it to reduce your fever, if you're taking it to reduce your pain during this time. So again, now I want to, I want to pull up another slide because I want to show you a little bit more of the chemistry behind how this actually works. So the proposed risk of NSAIDs, again, is that they in, can increase this ACE2 uh, receptor. And, and when you increase the ACE2 receptor, you actually can increase the level of the way the virus can enter your cell. But one of the other functions of NSAIDs is they actually, they block something called COX. Now, again, I'm, I don't want to get too chemical on you, but that stands for cyclooxygenase. It's an enzyme inside of all of our cell membranes. And COX enzymes are what, when, they're, when, they're, when a cell is damaged, there's another chemical that's released called arachidonic acid, and COX enzymes will act on that damage, and that will produce the byproducts of pain, inflammation, put an N there, pain and inflammation, which is, you know, again, this is what we associate with, with, with chronic inflammation, chronic inflammatory disease. So it's when 
again, it's it's when your cells are damaged. So a damaged cell, again, let's just let's just draw a line here. So a damaged cell will release something called AA. We're just going to abbreviate that arachidonic acid, and then this enzyme will act on that arachidonic acid, and it will create these things. So again, if we're thinking about this from a chemical perspective, this is kind of the way that works. That creates pain and inflammation. It also creates increased uh, permeability of your blood vessels, and that's why people get swelling. It's so like the same thing happens with trauma. If you hit something, it swells up. It fills with blood. It fills with water and fluid. Pain, swelling, inflammation, redness, all those things follow. So what, what these drugs do, again, is they block this enzyme, and therefore they reduce the pain and the inflammation and the secondary byproducts of that pain and inflammation. And so that's why a lot of people take these medications because they don't want to hurt. They don't want to feel pain. Now, I don't necessarily agree with using these medications, uh, but if a fever gets high enough and it, it becomes, the fever itself becomes a partly in part a danger to the health of the person, then, you know, sometimes using something to reduce a fever is not a bad move. But if you're taking ibuprofen or aspirin on a daily basis to reduce your pain, your physical pain. It's a very bad idea. As a matter of fact, it kills about 13,000 people a year, non steroidal anti inflammatories. And, you know, think about that in terms of just this virus so far. Aspirin and, and NSAIDs killed more people so far than COVID virus has. I and mean, that's not to diminish the effect the virus has is, is, is got the potential to have. But I, I just want you to understand that we're, we're in a different we're in a kind of in a different mindset right now where some people are, are having 104 plus degree fevers. And so the question becomes, again, do we reduce the fever? Or do we not reduce the fever? Again, if we look at the summary again, initially they were saying, don't use these drugs to reduce the fever because it could enhance the way the virus gets into your cell. And now they're saying that you can <laughs> reduce the fever because they're not so much worried about this. So why are they not so much worried about this? So I'm going to put this next slide up. This actually, I took this out of the um, Canadian Pharmacists Association put this together. So I took this directly from them. This is not me. This is not something. But this is based on a, on a, on a paper that they put together to kind of give an overview of the positive potential positive impacts of NSAIDs. And this is why, again, I think the WHO has or the WHO stands where it stands in terms of, yes, you can take ibuprofen if you want to reduce your fever. One of the things that has been shown from an NSAID perspective is it has antiviral properties. Okay. And so that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why. So does the antiviral property of an NSAID outweigh the fact that they increase this receptor on the cell and allow the potential for that virus to get in the cell? And that's what nobody really knows the answer to. So I don't even want to pretend like I know the answer to that, but I just want to share with you why it was being said. So that kind of cuts down a little bit on your confusion. So it's also important that you understand that this has not been studied really with COVID. So like when we say the antiviral effects of NSAIDs, we can't say that, that NSAIDs have an antiviral effect for COVID. We're saying that, that NSAIDs have an antiviral effect for influenza uh, because that's what's been studied at this point. So again, it's not, we can't just say NSAIDs because they have an antiviral effect to have an antiviral effect on every virus because that hasn't really actually been studied. Okay, so there's some animal studies, and there are some other studies that have shown, again, that it helps reduce the replication of viruses, but, but again, not for this coronavirus, not for this novel coronavirus that everybody's, you know, worried about right now. So that being the case, an antiviral property, but also an increase in the regulation of a, of a cell membrane call or a cell receptor called ACE2, which allows the virus to get better access into the cell. So if we look at this, kind of in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, they can do this, but there's one, there's kind of one other thing. So when, when I was over here talking about how NSAIDs block pain and inflammation, they do this by reducing, um, gosh, this is going to get really chemical folks. And I apologize if I'm losing some of you, but one of the things that happens when we have pain and inflammation, okay, is, is this happens as a result of the release of something called PGE2, prostaglandin E2, and one of the things that's important about prostaglandin, e, e, prostaglandin E2 is that it increases antibody production. So if you think about this, you know, one other in potential impact of what an NSAID can do is as it blocks this enzyme to reduce pain, inflammation, and prostaglandin E2, it also blocks your body's ability potentially to make antibodies to help you fight. So again, yeah, you kind of have to weigh it. 
what, what do you want to take? What, what do you want to take and how much do you want to take and when do you want to take it? And we'll talk about that in a minute. But again, I didn't want to get too, too darn technical tonight because this can get really, really confusing because it's biochemistry. So again, the NSAIDs have an antiviral effect by, in, by providing an effect that reduces viral replication. But on the flip side, they can reduce your ability to produce antibodies and they can upregulate a receptor on your cell that allows the virus to penetrate your cell. So think of it as like a seesaw, right? You got two versus one. So you got two, two negatives versus one positive. Make the call. Here's what the WHO is saying. Uh, the World Health Organization is saying that we do, do recommend that you can use ibuprofen and other NSAIDs as a fever reducing agent during this time. So again, I just wanted you guys to have that information so that you could potentially make a good decision. Now I'm going to put up another slide on the, a little bit of the chemistry here, because I want to show you kind of a walkthrough. So let's put up slide uh, on, here we go. Perfect. So here's what you're, what you're looking at here um, on, on this particular slide. And I'm going to erase my board while I'm talking to you. So what you're, you should be looking at are a bunch of orange boxes. And so what you see on the top there is you see um, a couple of different chemicals. There's phospholipase A2, which is PLA2. We just abbreviated as PLA2. This chemical, and then you see another chemical on the other side called COX enzyme. So those two things, when your cell breaks open, when there's cell damage, you'll see a box on the left that says cell damage. So when your cell gets damaged, what happens, you get cell damage, and that releases a compound called AA. Okay. Now, arachidonic acid, or AA, the COX enzyme kind of gets together with that arachidonic acid and then together what they do is they create inflammation. All right. Again, I'm just trying to make this as simple as possible as I can for you. If you look at phospholipase A2, it also acts on, on, on the same area and it can create again in a release uh, of inflammatory mediators, potentially or not potentially, but the big chemical that gets released is PGE2 prostaglandin E2. It's just a type of chemical that is produced inside your cells as they're damaged and as those enzymes take effect on them. So the out outcome of having PGE2, so what happens is PGE2 stimulates fever, it stimulates pain, okay, and it increases antibody production. So again, just trying to show you this diagram so that you kind of, I drew a picture of it earlier, but it was a little bit more confusing than I wanted it to be. So just trying to make it more simple and easier looking for you. Now, once that happens, so this is what we call acute inflammation. Acute inflammation is the part of inflammation when the damage is initially done. And this is where people get into trouble in the hospitals. It's not chronic inflammation with this illness. It's acute inflammation, pneumonia, and, and, and inflammation that occurs in the lungs. It's that acute inflammation that releases, right? All, all this prostaglandin is released that leads to uh, an, a, kind of an opening of the barriers in the lungs so that things become more permeable and fluid in blood and, and uh, cytokines and other things that your immune system sends in there to fight are, are flooding in. And so we get this acute inflammatory response, which is this really heightened inflammation. And with that heightened inflammation, over the, you know, if it's acutely, it's got to happen. So we kind of want that acute inflammation because after acute inflammation, we get healing. So if we block the acute aspect of inflammation altogether, then it also can actually potentially slow down the healing process. And that's really what I want you to understand. Now, again, if you're in the hospital and you need to block acute inflammation to save your life, that's one thing. But if you're at home and, and how can we start to apply this? Let me show you the next slide because I want to show you, um, okay, where... So now what you're looking at is you're looking at a slide here and you see that PLA2 enzyme, you see a big black X on it and you'll see that steroids and quercetin. So this is where one of the mechanisms of action of how steroids block inflammation is when, you're, when you have damage, this enzyme PLA2 is blocked by steroids. And so that stops the inflammatory damage from persisting and going on. But again, long-term steroids also inhibit the healing process. You'll also see there though underneath steroids, you'll see something called quercetin. So quercetin is a bioflavonoid. It's a plant-based product or plant-based chemical that has anti-inflammatory properties on that enzyme. 
And so it, it, it just doesn't have them. It's not like you can't put one gram to one steroid gram together and, and compare them because the steroid is going to work a lot more aggressively than the quercetin, but the quercetin can have a very nice anti-inflammatory effect. If you're taking it prophylactically, there's actually research studies that show quercetin has antiviral properties. Quercetin actually can reduce the risk of developing um, upper airway diseases, upper, upper uh, respiratory tract infections and things of that nature. So I'm just, what I'm trying to do is show you kind of how we can think about uh, fevers and how the mechanism behind how fevers work. So if you look again, let's go to the next one because that next slide, yeah. So now you see that quercetin also blocks the cyclooxygenase enzyme. So quercetin, again, I was, I was talking earlier about how NSAIDs could block this enzyme, that COX enzyme. And now we're showing you that quercetin can also block it. And, and the reason I'm showing that to you is because quercetin can block it, but quercetin can block it not quite as aggressively, but without interfering with the healing phase after the acute inflammatory phase is over. So that's, that's one of the benefits of having quercetin or using quercetin. And that's why a lot of scientists are focusing in on quercetin as a potential uh, for COVID-19. It's, it's no, there's no research studies that have been done, but there's some major studies that are getting ready to be approved and launched on the use of, quer of quercetin. So now I would not recommend quercetin to, if you go to my board, I wouldn't recommend quercetin to block the COX enzyme to reduce a fever because it doesn't work quite that way. Quercetin is one of those things when you have high levels of it in your system for longer periods of time, it can be very, very helpful at modulating inflammation, but it's not something that's going to give you, if you have an acute fever of 105, it's not something that's going to take that fever of 105 and push it down to 103 or 102. So, so quercetin is not going to have that acute fever reducing capacity, but it is going to have that uh, that overall reduction in overall inflammatory capacity. And why do we want to know about this as it relates to any virus? Well, the research shows that quercetin, but through its effect on inflama inflammatory modulation, doesn't just modulate inflammation. It also it can inhibit viral replication in, in, in multiple different areas. And I'll show you some information on that in just a minute. But quercetin, very, very powerful as a nutrient in regards to immune function. So a lot of you have asked me, we've been getting this all week because vitamin C is very scarce right now. So a lot of you have been writing in and asking Dr. Osborne, what can I use if I wanna support my immune system right now? What can I use instead of vitamin C? I just can't find any vitamin C. Well, one of the things you can use is quercetin. Quercetin is, is very, very good at a lot of the things that vitamin C is good at. And because of its also, because of its antiviral properties, it's actually been studied to be antiviral against the rhinovirus against influenza, against the hepatitis virus, against Ebola virus. So there are a number of research studies that show that quercetin has very potent antiviral effects. And so I wanted to share that with you because again, that question keeps coming in. So I wanna back up just a minute because I got, I got too far ahead of where I wanted to go. So uh, take me back up to, oh, maybe down further, I'm sorry. Yeah, so let's yeah, let's just throw that that next slide up. Quercetin research antiviral properties. So let's let's just dive into it. I'm gonna come back to the fever and why whether because some of you have probably got the question in your head, well, what about Tylenol? We're gonna come back to that in just a minute. So quercetin has a number of, of researched antiviral properties. So the slide, I'm gonna pop this slide up on the big screen for you. You can you can see this, but uh, in this particular study, the Journal of Infectious Diseases and Preventative Medicine. You can see that uh, recent research, you know, points to uh, flavanol antioxidant quercetin as having therapeutic properties. Quercetin has been shown to reduce viral uh, internalization. That means it stops, helps to stop the virus from getting into the cell, as well as in reducing viral replication in vitro. What does that mean? That means these studies are not done in the human body. They're more done in kind of in a petri dish effect. Uh, and so I want to be very, very clear about what these studies are showing. And so, but also reducing viral load and lung inflammation in the airways in hyper response to people who are hyper responsive in vivo. So what does in vivo mean? Means in vivo means study in the body. Okay. So quercetin has been researched both in the Petri dish, but it's also been researched in human and actual humans to reduce Okay, to reduce the aggressive inflammation 
in hypersensitive individuals. Now, again, this has not been studied in COVID, so don't, I want to be very, very clear with my disclaimer. I don't want any of you thinking that what I'm telling you to do is just to go take a bunch of quercetin and that's going to treat your COVID. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is, is that research has shown that quercetin has a, a reduction property in inflammation. Okay. And in this, in these studies, in some of these studies, we're talking more about influenza and rhinovirus, uh, but it reduces the inflammation in the lungs to people who have hypersensitive responses to the pneumonia. So again, it's helping to reduce that inflammation, those hyper-responsive patients. Well, those are the ones that we're worried about, right? The people that are overreacting. So again, I, I'm showing you this to show you that there's a potential mechanism. And again, it hasn't been studied in COVID-19, but there's a potential viral, antiviral mechanism and anti-inflammatory mechanism that quercetin has already shown in both human studies and in vitro studies to be a very, very powerful mechanism at reduction of inflammation. So let's, let's now go to the next slide. So this is actually taken from, uh, from the same article. So you can see that in, in, there are different things. This, this, basically what this picture is showing you is that quercetin, it, does, it has multiple effects, right? So number one, it inhibits viral replication at various stages. Number two, it blocks endocytosis. What does that word mean? That means it blocks the ability for the virus to get into the cell. So it blocks that from happening. But number three, it increases the viral clearance or the viral clearance by enhancing mitochondria antiviral responses. So when you add all of that together, it also creates an, uh, a reduced pro-inflammatory uh, component. So in essence, it reduces... Uh, the inflammatory aspect of how the virus could potentially impact or affect somebody. So again, this is coming out of, uh, of research studies. I'm showing you already studied benefits of quercetin, although not on COVID-19, but on other forms of viral infection. So next, let's go to the, the next slide. So, so this study is on quercetin and influenza A. So again, we'll pull the slide up for you here. And you see here we found that quercetin inhibited influenza infection with a wide spectrum of strains. So this was not a study done on humans so much as it was done kind of in a lab measuring the effect of quercetin on different types of viral strains. So the study summarized as this. The study indicates that quercetin showing inhibitory activity in the early stage of influenza infection provides a future therapeutic option to develop effective, safe, and affordable natural products for the treatment and prophylaxis of IAV infection. IAV is influenza A virus. So again, this study showing quercetin's antiviral properties and effects. Um, so one is showing you, let's go to the next slide. I'm just gonna keep showing you some of the research because I want you to see how much research is actually being done on this natural agent. And I think personally, I think along with the vitamin C, the IV vitamin C therapies that are starting to be looked at in China, I think they should be looking at quercetin as a major, as a major agent as well because of its properties. So in this study here, you can see quercetin reduces susceptibility to influenza infection following stressful exercise. So this was actually a human study. Actually, no, this one was a mouse study. We have a human study that was done as well. Uh, was, you can see these data suggest that short-term quercetin findings or feedings rather may uh, prove to be an effective strategy to lessen the impact of stressful exercise on susceptibility to respiratory infection. And one of the things that intense exercise does is it can increase the risk for developing respiratory infection. So this brings me to another point or another tip tonight, which is those of you who maybe are thinking about doing hyper aggressive exercise right now, you should just be aware that, you know, you should be exercising, you should be moving, but a super aggressive exercise right now might not be the best thing to do as it can increase your risk for developing uh, an, an, an upper infection in the airway. So again, quercetin, by the way, and this, let's see, let's skip that one and go to, uh, no, go back up. Sorry. Go back up. No, go down. Sorry. I told you to skip one, but I want you to just go back to it. Yeah, here we go. So here's another research study. Uh, oh, go, yeah, there we go. On uh, flavonoid-mediated inhibition of SARS coronavirus. So again, this was this was a study that uh, there's a protein called a uh, 3C-like protease, which um, in severe acute respiratory syndrome uh, associated with coronavirus. Now, this is not COVID-19, but this is um, SARS-CoV. Uh, but this research study shows that quercetin and a number of other natural agents as as well, epigallocatechin and gallate and and uh, gallocatechin gallate 
which are some of the ingredients found in green teas, display good inhibition toward this particular protein, this 3C-like protease, which again, this protein uh, plays a role in the development of acute respiratory issues associated with the SARS uh, SARS-CoV coronavirus. So uh, again, this study is showing that quercetin and other natural agents actually have some, some good, we'll say potential for blocking certain proteins that can make the disease worse. Again, these are not human trials. These are, these are, are studies that are called kinetic studies. So they're actually just showing the, the potential property for this nutrient or this, um, not, not necessarily nutrient, but this plant-based ingredient quercetin or bioflavonoid quercetin to have potential as an antiviral, uh, antiviral medication. And then we go into the next study, which is COVID-19. Now this is brand new. This, you can see on the data on this one, this was just published and on March 13th, as, as a matter of fact, um, this, this study was done. It's, it's, it's a type of study. Uh, it's, it's not a, it's a docking study. So it's not actually a study done in humans, but it's kind of like, think of it like a computer algorithm where we're they're, they're looking at, in this case, they were looking at something called COVID-19 main protease, which is one of the main proteins, uh, from this COVID-19. And they're trying, they're trying to find agents, potential therapeutic agents that can interfere with this protein. And so quercetin was one of those that came up on the list in their model study. So again, a molecular docking study, it's not a study that's been performed on humans, but it's a study that's done to try to say, okay, what things could we use in humans? What things should we be trying in humans so that we can research this further? That's what this type of study is, is illustrating. Again, it's too soon and, and there are no research studies on quercetin in COVID-19, but what this study is showing is that, that quercetin has good affinity for binding the COVID-19 main protease, which could be a potential therapeutic benefit. Again, it needs to be further studied, but I wanted to show that to you because this is brand new. And then I've got one more slide for you because there's uh, actually two more. So if you, yeah, there we go. So this expert excerpt, this following excerpt that, that I took, this was actually from a report, not from a research paper, but uh, is, a, is a doctor and his group in Montreal are actually getting ready. They're, they've just announced they're getting ready to study quercetin in a big way. So if we can go to that next slide, I want to just kind of read for you what, uh, what uh, Dr. Michael Creighton um, is doing. So this doc, he's a renowned scientist at the Clinical Research Institute of Montreal, along with his co-researcher, Congolese scientist Manjambu Mabike. Um, Dr. Crichton is currently awaiting approval to send the drug derived from plants. And again, the drug is referred to in this case as quercetin, right? For clinical trials that will test it against the novel coronavirus. While this would be the first clinical study to test quercetin against COVID-19, natural health experts have long credited this natural plant pigment with the ability to deal with a variety of viruses. In fact, Dr. Creighton describes quercetin as a broad spectrum antiviral that has been shown in studies to be effective against formidable diseases such as SARS, Ebola virus, and the Zika virus, uh, and as well as, as some of the things I showed you earlier, rhinovirus and influenza. Now, incoming data from quercetin trial will be monitored minute by minute from Montreal in a series of interviews and articles. Dr. Creighton has released details of the imminent study once the team is granted approval to send the quercetin to China, samples will be delivered to the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Wuhan. Canadian and Chinese, and Chinese scientists will then collaborate on the trials, which will involve about 1,000 test patients. Uh, Dr. Creighton and Mabike will join colleagues from the nonprofit International Consortium of Antivirals, which Creighton helped to found in 2004 as a response to the SARS epidemic and maintaining a round-the-clock communication center. From there, they will be able to monitor patients' progress in Wuhan, including viewing patients' charts and x-rays, according to Dr. Creighton. It may be possible to have results on quercetin's ability to treat COVID within 60 days of the beginning of the trial. So this is, again, this is getting ready to happen, hopefully sooner rather than later. So we'll have this data that we can share uh, with you guys as things evolve from this research study. So again, this is you know, the answer to so many of you that have called in or that have asked, you know, what can we use the vitamin C's on the sh store shelves or empty? Is there something we can do to support our immune system? Look, my opinion and one of the things that, that I'm doing right now is my vitamin C's, even my personal ones are low, are running low, is using quercetin. Now, again, I'm not saying that quercetin 
is going to prevent COVID-19. I'm not saying that it's going to treat your COVID-19. I'm just simply saying that it's very, very promising. A lot of research is showing the antiviral properties of quercetin. And so, you know, if you're just trying to step out there and do something proactive, this is something if you want to use it and you can't get your hands on vitamin C, you know, go for it with quercetin. Now, I want to come back for a minute. What we were talking about with NSAIDs and what we were talking about with, with you know, drugs like Tylenol or acetaminophen um, for fever reduction, because I promised you I would, I would kind of talk about this. So both, we don't want to, like I said, we don't want to try to use something like quercetin and vitamin C to reduce an acute fever if the fever is becoming life-threatening. So if the fever is getting so high that it's not being controlled, we don't really want to try to use a natural agent to do that. We want to use something potentially a little bit stronger. Now, some people would say, you know, don't, don't use these things like, like, you know, the old saying is, is let it ride, like let the fever ride. And I've got a slide on that too, Mel, if we can get that one queued up too. But um, fever reduction can be done with Tylenol, but here's the problem with using Tylenol. I showed you earlier, the problem with NSAIDs is that NSAIDs, although there's some antiviral properties, but not as far as we know with COVID, NSAIDs can reduce your body's ability to make antibodies and NSAIDs can also um, you know, have the potential to increase the receptor on the cell that allows COVID in to your cell to hijack your cell. Tylenol, on the other hand, will reduce a fever, but Tylenol leads to a depletion of a very important key nutrient called glutathione. And glutathione is one of the main antioxidants in your lungs that protects you from things like pneumonia and has very, very strong antioxidant properties to protect you from that inflammation. It's also what your liver uses to detoxify your body in a very big way. We did a whole show a couple of weeks ago on NAC. If you haven't watched that show, go back and watch it. NAC is responsible. It's one of the precursors to helping your body produce glutathione. And like I said, Tylenol inhibits glutathione. It depletes glutathione. I, that's kind of more of an accurate way to say it. It doesn't really inhibit it. It depletes it. It depletes it from the storage. And so if you're using, you know, Tylenol or NSAIDs, you've got to weigh the risks of what the out, what they could potentially do versus the risk of that fever actually creating a major issue. And this is not, this is not something I can tell you to do or not to do. This is really something you need to be speaking with your doctor about if, you know, if you're working with a doctor, but as a general rule of thumb, uh, let's, is that slide up, Mel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're looking at this slide right now, so I pulled this from, you know, again, from the medical research, it just says, you know, should you take anything to lower your fever, suppress it or let it ride? What this is saying is there are two basic fields of thought. Fever should be suppressed because the metabolic costs outweigh the potential physiological benefit in an already stressed host, right? And so again, this is where you make the judgment call. Um, but then the second field of thought is that fever is a protective adaptive response that should be allowed to run its course under most circumstances. The latter approach, sometimes referred to as the let it ride philosophy, has been supported by several recent randomized controlled trials and uh, which are challenging earlier observational studies and may be pushing the pendulum away from the Pavlovian treatment response. Again, this study was published in 2015, basically stating that, you know, you may just want to let the fever go. Now, again, I think it's still a judgment call. Um, and you, you know, you've got to work with your doc to make that judgment call. Because if the fever's, like I said, if the fever's 100, 405 and burning you up and it's just wasting you away and you're, you're not able to function, you know, maybe time to look at a fever reducing agent. I think where people run into bigger problems with Tylenol blocking or inhibiting glutathione is, 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 is consistent use, repetitive use over and over and over and over again. And then same thing with NSAIDs. The bigger risk long term is not to take it once or twice to reduce a fever, but it's if you're taking it on a, on a pretty semi-regular basis to block that inflammation, then what you get as, as an outcome are those potential risks that we talked about tonight. So should you, should you reduce a fever? I think you have to take it on a case by case basis. And so, and so there's no, there's no one way that's right for everyone again. So some people also, what we're learning about body temperature is that, you know, the classic 98.6, which is what everybody's taught. It's what I was taught. If your body temperature's uh, not 98.6, then somehow you're completely abnormal. Well, there's a range for humans. I mean, that range can can go. I mean, some people ride under under 98.6. They run at 97.6, and some people ride in that 
kind of 99 zone. So some people are hotter, some people are cooler, and some people are right in the middle. And so, you know, for these people that run a lower, like me, I run generally around a 97.8, 98 degree temperature on average, and my thyroid works just fine. Um, you know, for me, 104 fever is really 105 fever. So if you're, you know, if you're, if you're basing it on, on when to, when to make the call to lower the fever, you also have to keep in mind kind of what your, what your normal base is and base it from there. So anyway, I think I belabored that. We talked about it a little bit last time too. So I wanted to cover that again tonight and just cover why, because a lot of you chimed in on that last video about, you know, the, we shouldn't be taking ibuprofen right now. So I wanted you to understand the mechanism and I wanted you to understand that the WHO, the World Health Organization actually doesn't recommend not taking ibuprofen. They actually, I think they reversed their position once the, the research actually came out and there was no really valid research that they could base that claim on. So they kind of reversed their position from the original. So now we're gonna open up the floor for questions. Um, that any of you have. Thanks for tuning in again with me tonight. Um, let's see, JD says, what if you can't take the NSAID? Well, then, you, you know, JD, if you're talking about to reduce the fever, if you can't take the NSAID, then you have other option. You have the Tylenol as an option. Again, you have to weigh when that time would be right for you or if at that time would even come. Uh, you know, a lot of people will, will get a kind of a low grade 102 fever. And in my opinion, again, it's just my opinion. If your fever is 102, 103 and, and uh, and you're still somewhat functional, then I think my opinion is let it ride. You can use cold compresses. You can use a cooler bath, uh, Epsom salt bath. You know, not when I say cool, I don't mean cold. I mean, just kind of lukewarm where you're getting in that and it's trying to help bring your body temperature down. So there, I mean, there are a number of other strategies that you can use to reduce your fever safely and naturally. Kevin wants to know about safe levels of zinc daily. Um, safe levels for most people, adults, 100 milligrams a day is a pretty safe level. You have to be careful long-term dosing with that. Uh, if you long-term dose zinc, you can actually create a copper deficiency. So when I say long-term, I mean, if you're doing it for greater than two, three months, you really should start thinking about your copper status as well. Yeah, so Matthew Gibbs wants to know in general, when should you lower fever above 104? Again, I, it's, it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis. And so this is where I know it's kind of a cop-out answer for me to say this to you, but you should get with your doctor to make that decision if you're not certain or you're not sure. Now, I always say one of the best uh, one of the best judges of this is mom. Uh, mom's intuition is one of the best judges of when you start to break a fever when you shouldn't. It's because uh, moms have like that that magic. I'll say a magic radar, but they just really do. They have that intuitive ability to know, okay, it's time, it's time to get it down. So, you know, as a parent, those of you with small kids, those of you even uh, who maybe aren't parents, but just wondering when to re lower a fever, using your own intuition and your own good judgment is, is also something that I think is, is underrated today. Like you don't want to outsource all the decisions to other people who aren't living in your body and paying attention to how you feel and when you should lower that fever. Uh, and sometimes you can make that decision on your own. So Marie wants to know, um, hey, doc, I wanted to follow your advice on NAC, but I can't find acetylcysteine in my country. I ordered your products, but they can't make through customs. Is acetylcysteine the same as N-acetylcysteine? Yes, it is, Marie. Um, it's also the same as N-acetyl-L-cysteine. So you'll see it written in those different variations, but it's all NAC at the end of the day. As long as, long as you see N-acetylcysteine or NAC, or n acetyl l cysteine those are all synonymous with each other. Barb says, I've heard quercetin is hard to absorb. How much do you suggest to take? Um, so quercetin is not hard to absorb if you take it in the right form. Um, dihydrate form, which is, which is what I use, um, we have something called Ultra Q, which is a, a thousand milligram pills of quercetin in the water soluble form. So it's really well absorbed. Um, you know, if you're just doing kind of, let's just say immune support, um, you know, you can take, I, my advice would be to take two a day, just kind of general health two a day for good support. If you're talking about more aggressive use, I have people take up to eight a day, uh, of quercetin, uh, eight grams a day, um, to get, to get through, um, rougher spots. So, it's, you know, anywhere from one gram all the way up to eight grams a day of water soluble version. 
If you, if you're, you know, Tamiflu, some people are asking, Mary wants to know about Tamiflu. I, you know, think about Tamiflu. There's no, there's no documented evidence that Tamiflu does anything for COVID-19. So, I mean, you know, if, if your doctor prescribed it to you and you've got a good relationship with that doctor, have that conversation with that doctor. It's really hard for me to say, but there's no research that shows that Tamiflu is going to do anything for COVID-19. So, um, Sandy wants to know if quercetin has the potential ability to help people with acute asthma. Possibly. Again, if we go back and look at the mechanism of action, quercetin blocks Cox enzyme, but it also blocks PLA2. If we can put that, 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 um, that second one back up on the board, I can kind of, again, I want to just show you the picture of it. Um, yeah, that second, that one right there. Uh, no, keep going. Actually, that one will work. We can use this one. Um, so you see, if you're, what you, if you're looking at the screen right now, what you're seeing is, again, you're seeing um, on the left-hand side, you're see, you see that PLA2 enzyme. Well, steroids and bioflavonoids. And just so you know, bioflavonoid, quercetin is one of the most potent bioflavonoids, period. So, so you can replace that word bioflavonoid for quercetin. Then you, so you see that's one way that, that, that quercetin works to help with inflammation. Then you go over to the Cox enzyme, and you can see that, that NSAIDs, ginger, turmeric, and bioflavonoids. So again, turmeric can help with this too, and ginger as well. But bioflavonoid, again, meaning quercetin, can help with that. So this quercetin has two mechanisms of action. It, it binds to PLA2 or, or blocks the conversion uh, of PLA2 to create prostaglandin E2, but it also binds to COX enzymes and, and prevents them from, you know, from, from uh, creating prostaglandin E2 in mass. So it, it, it can help in that regard. It has those known mechanisms. Now, should you use that to treat acute asthma? My advice would be don't try to take anything to treat acute asthma. Try to find out more what actually is creating the acute asthma. For most people, the asthma is either coming from an environmental agent in which case quercetin has been shown in a number of studies to help to stabilize mast cell release. So mast cells are those cells that release chemicals that cause all the symptoms of allergy. Same thing happens with asthma or can happen in asthmatic situations. Uh, so quercetin as a bioflavonoid has been shown and there are a number of research studies that have shown that quercetin has a really great anti-inflammatory effect that way. Um, but you know, a lot of people's asthma is actually caused by things like wheat. The wheat can induce asthma, gluten can induce asthma, dairy can induce asthma, other foods can induce asthma. So if you haven't had your food levels checked or haven't had your food tested to see, that would be a better, to me, a better thing than to just take quercetin indefinitely. Okay, so let's go back to the questions. Shauna, how do you spell what? Um, quercetin, Q yeah, somebody's typed it in and I've actually been on the board plenty now. So I think we've answered that question. So. Nancy wants to know where here can we find it, where can we find it and when we should take it. I mean, you can if we could pop up Ultra Q um, in the feed. What I'll do, Nancy, is I'll put up Ultra Q is a is a high dose quercetin, water soluble quercetin. Uh, I'll put that up in the feed. That's where you can find it, and you know when you should take it is up to you. Um, you could take it at any time. Mary said, Mary wants to know, Dr. Osborne, I'm receiving so many messages from people regarding mass doses of vitamin C, hydrating therapy. Are you getting these messages too? It's very confusing. You know, the, I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of people out there right now that, that are talking about a lot of different things. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to pass judgment or, or even really qualify their statements because, you know, I get all these emails and I just, I delete them. People that send me emails about, you know, vitamins and minerals and other things for, you know, for immune support. I mean, I consider myself to be the expert. So I generally don't get confused by other people who maybe aren't the experts, but are promoting things that I might not recommend. Uh, again, I can't judge the information that you're getting. I would just say that Mary, if you're tuning into the pick Dr. Osborne's brain show, everything we talk about is research based. Everything we talk about is experience based and practice-based, which is different than people who are sending emails out that don't really practice, that don't have any real-world experience and application using these things. I think there's a big difference between being an academic and being somebody who's in the trenches doing this stuff on a regular basis with people. And so that's all I can really say to that, um, to that comment. 
So what about fever in children? The same thing applies, Linda, with fever in children. I think the same kind of general rule applies. Let's see here. Angeline says, hi, Dr. Osborne. I'm taking 8,000 milligrams of omega-3 EPA and DHA for my arthritis. Is high dose fish oil a good idea at the time of corona? I love this question, Angeline. Let's go back to that last slide, Mel, with the diagram. I'm going to show you something, Angeline. I didn't really comment on this. I just didn't want to get so deep in the biochemistry that everybody was like bored and like tuned out. But look at this slide. If you can look at this slide, look up at the top on the right, it says Cox enzyme. And to the right of that, you'll see omega-3 fats. And so one of the functions of omega-3 fats is that they actually compete with the Cox enzyme to break down arachidonic acid. So this is one of the reasons why omega-3 fats are anti-inflammatory. This is why a lot of people take them for arthritis, because remember, arthritis is an inflammatory condition. Well, remember that the damage that viruses cause, that damage is, it occurs as a result of inflammation as well. So making sure that you have adequate omega-3 to support your immune system is one of the most important things that you can do. So, you know, they're really, in, in normal times, in regular times, there, there are just a few different supplements that I personally take on a regular basis. And one of them is vitamin C, and one of them is a good quality multivitamin, but the third is a really potent omega-3 fatty acid. And the reason why is I just don't eat enough cold water fish to get the level of omega-3 that, uh, that's necessary on a day-to-day -day basis. So omega-3 is a great thing to take. Now, now let's, go, let's go back to Angeline's question, which is you're taking 8,000 milligrams or eight grams a day, you can use that. It's a very therapeutic dose um, and you can use that. What I would tell you to pay attention to, Angelina, is if you start bruising really easy or if you start seeing like spontaneous nosebleeds or if you get a cut and it just won't clot, it just keeps bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and bleeding, that may mean that your, your level of omega-3 is too high. Remember, one of the side effects of omega-3 is it inhibits, it inhibits PGE2, but we didn't talk about this. It also inhibits thromboxane A2. So thromboxane A2 is important for platelet aggregation. So your platelets are sticky and, 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 they, and they are what clot your blood or help your blood to clot. So if you're taking too much anti-inflammatory that has an effect on this, it can actually cause you to bleed a little bit more. This is why omega-3 fatty acids have a thinning effect on the blood. And at that dose and getting high, even higher, can't have that effect. Now, if you're not experiencing those things, then you're okay. But is taking omega-3 a good idea right now? In my opinion, it's a great idea right now. And if you're not on omega-3, I highly recommend any of you listening, if you're, not, if you're not a big cold water fish person and you're not on an omega-3, it's one of the best things that you can take and kind of think of it as a kind of a baseline good dose for just a solid nutrition is two grams a day. Uh, Monica Sheck, we get this question a lot, but I'm going to answer it again. Um, is elderberry syrup helpful? Elderberry is helpful. And there's this big myth going around the internet right now that elderberry causes a cytokine storm. Throw that myth in the garbage with the person who ever created that myth. It's, it's total nonsense. Elderberry does not cause a cytokine storm. The problem with elderberry syrups, however, is that they contain sugar. And so if you're using a lot of elderberry syrup and, it's, you're, and you're getting a lot of sugar with that, sugar is not a good idea right now. So this is, again, one of the reasons why uh, you know, my, my, my Virid, which is what one of my favorite formulas for immune support is, Virid has elderberry in it, and it's not in a syrup form. It's in a pill form, and you can swallow it, and you can still get the benefit of elderberry without all the syrup. So Corinne wants to know, if you give the body calcium, it doesn't have to raise the temp to pull calcium from the bones. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand your question. Maybe if you reword that for me, I can, and I can understand what you're, what you're asking, I can give you a better answer. Let's see here, Juan, hi, since many celiacs suffer from low stomach acid, shouldn't they supplement on an empty stomach with HCL caps, easier digestion? It's a great question. And yet the answer is yes and no, and here's why. Um, Gosh, we're going to run out of room again. So we look at a stomach, just kind of a general drawing of a stomach, right? The stomach's lined with these cells called parietal cells. And these parietal cells secrete acid. And what happens to some celiacs, um, you know, the, the kind of the wrong thought and the, the pervasive belief is that celiac disease is only a disease of the small intestine. Well, this is the stomach. And this is the small intestine down here. 
And, and so the pervasive myth is that celiac damage only occurs in the small intestine, and that's not true. It actually can occur in the stomach. There are a lot of cases of gastritis where these cells become damaged, and they can damage your body's ability to make that acid. So if these cells get damaged, it reduces your acid. And so then in that case, taking like an acid supplement, like a betaine hydrochloride, or, you know, we use, my formula is called ultra acid. Taking that could be beneficial for you. But if you are a celiac who eats well, controls your diet, maybe you had gastritis originally from the gluten exposure, but it's now healed and now you can produce stomach acid adequately, it may not be the right move for you. So it depends. It depends on whether or not you're an active celiac having active damage or whether you're a celiac that's in remission because you've changed your diet and you're living healthier. Uh, Greg's, uh, A. Greggs wants to know, does apple cider vinegar actually help anyone? I've never noticed anything from taking it. It can. I mean, apple cider vinegar, speaking of acid, it's a, it's a mild acid. So some people you know, report improvement of digestion. And those people that typically report that have this type of problem where their stomach acid is already a little bit low. So, so question on the COX-1 and 2 inhibitors. Do they alter vasoconstriction effectuating the relief? That what they do, what they what COX inhibitors really do ultimately, and some of them have been researched to increase the risk for heart disease. Some have been incre uh, shown to increase the risk for other problems like, you know, gastric bleeding, intestinal bleeding, vitamin C deficiency, iron deficiency, folate deficiency. Um, again, I don't recommend COX-1 or COX-2 inhibitors for any great length of time. Uh, and definitely not chronic use, um, not without finding the origin of why the problem exists in the first place. Yeah, so Bar Bobette's asking, instead of NSAIDs, could cool baths work? Yes, they could. They could be a strategy in your repertoire for trying to reduce a fever. Uh, I think I answered the question on Tylenol already. Um, I think I answered the, the comment on how much quercetin. It's a two to eight, really one to eight grams a day. Um, Melissa wants to know, do I have recommendations, nutritional recommendations for a child with mycoplasma pneumonia? Lots of them, but it, they would all be based around proper testing and proper, uh, proper evaluation. So no generic ones. Um, so Daniel's having uh, continued diaphoresis or sweating on the palms and feet with syncopial e episodes uh, while intermittent fasting using keto as the vehicle to accomplish. If, so you may have a blood sugar problem, Daniel. Um, have you checked your fasting blood sugar? Uh, if you're having, especially if you're having syncope, uh, you could very well be getting your blood sugar could be dropping too low, and, you, and it, even using a ketogenic diet as a as a vehicle, if you're not keto adapted, then you know that can be part of the kind of the you know what some people refer to as the keto flu, that initial stage of keto. Uh, let's see here. So Susan says hi from Italy, not allowed out yet. Susan, I'd love for you to chime in in the. Um, in the feed and just tell us how things are going in Italy. I think a lot of people, you know, we look at our media outlets and we look at our media sources and a lot of them are biased. A lot of them are very misleading. And I'd love for somebody who's actually inside the trenches of Italy to kind of give some feedback on what actually is going on over there, Susan. So if you don't mind chiming in about what's happening, that'd be great. I think the audience would greatly appreciate it too. So Lori says, is quercetin better for one who has hemochromatosis because vitamin C is not recommended? Uh, because vitamin C, vitamin C does not actually absorb iron. Vitamin C increases the absorption of iron. So yes, in that regard, you could use quercetin as a as an alternative. So Virginia wants to know about how much vitamin C. Now I did a whole show on that, Virginia. If you haven't gone back, and so those of you maybe are new tonight and haven't tuned in to pick Dr. Osborne's brain before, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And make sure you sign up on our news uh, on our newsletter list over at glutenfreesociety.org so that we can send you updates, uh, you know, as we put updates out. But um, and and so that you can access our archives of videos. But you know, vitamin C, how much vitamin C to take right now is dependent upon weight uh, for most people. But it's it's also dependent on something called bowel tolerance. So you take as much as your bowel will tolerate without creating diarrhea. If we're talking about oral oral vitamin C.
So Mary says, uh, may not be very smart in this area. That's okay, Mary. That's why you're here to learn. What causes you to run a fever of 100 to 104 plus? You may have already said it. Again, the fever is being induced largely by the release of different chemicals as a result of cellular damage. So as, as a virus, or even if we're not talking about a virus, a virus, a bacteria, or any other microorganism that creates an infectious process, can create cellular damage that leads to the release of arachidonic acid and subsequently the production of prostaglandins and thromboxanes and other cytokines that actually stimulate or trigger the inflammatory response that can also spike a fever. Your body's natural response to try to fight a bad guy is to mount a fever because it's that fever that your body uses to try to purge as much of that microorganism as it can possibly purge. So the fever is actually I mean, this is one of the reasons why a lot of researchers and a lot of doctors say let a fever ride because the fever is actually beneficial for the actual infection. And if you and if you break a fever every time it starts to happen, you don't get the potential benefit of that fever. So Wanda wants to know um, why aren't they using chloroquine when they've had good results? You know, I don't. I can't answer for that. I, there are side effects to chloroquine use, and that's something that's not really they're not really talking about in great deal. I think there are a lot of options for doctors to use. And my, my again, this is my opinion. I, I really wish they would get the studies on vitamin C done because I really strongly believe that IV vitamin C is probably gonna be one of the best mechanisms to, to help support the recovery of these chronically sick or acutely sick, acutely infected people. I, I, I don't think there's, I don't think chloroquine is a magic answer at all. Um, Let's see. Let's see here. Uh, Amber, will hospital personnel allow you to request quercetin or will they give you what they want? Good luck with, with having a hospital give you quercetin, Amber. Um, you say that word and they're probably going to look at you like you've got zombie horns coming out of your head. Um, no, you got to, quercetin is something you're going to do voluntarily on your own if, if it's something that you're interested in doing. Again, we, we put that link up. I don't know if we put it up on, on that feed, but we'll get that link up for you if you're interested in using quercetin as, a, as an agent to support immune health. Um, let's see. Maggie says, my daughter started taking NAC and said that her lungs felt better than they have in a long time. She has non-critical asthma and thanked me profusely for suggesting it after watching your NAC video. Rock on, Maggie. If I could give you a high five across the YouTube screen, I would do it. I love hearing those kinds of stories. Um, I agree, Marilyn. I wish the media would stop reporting the CV deaths without also stating when and if they were underlying, if they if there were underlying issues. Look, here's my opinion on this. Some of you are going to get super mad at me right now, and I don't really care. This is my opinion, and I'm entitled to it, just like you all have yours. I think that that the media is blowing this thing so far up beyond what it actually is. Now, that's not to diminish the areas that are seeing a lot more of this and diminish the people that are having problems from it. But I think when you look at the actual statistics, when you look at the health of the individuals who are picking this thing up, look, in America, why is this thing gonna blast through America and hurt people? Because America's health, frankly, sucks. People don't take care of themselves, they don't get adequate sleep, they work themselves to death, they eat terrible food, they drive through the drive throughs and they call that eating. And then when something comes along that actually challenges them and it breaks them, of course, it's going to do, of course, that's going to be the outcome. Many of these people, 46 million people in the U.S. estimated are taking drugs that suppress the immune system. So now we have a major infection that has a very, very high prolific rate of spread. And these people are being immunosuppressed. Yes, they're going to pick things up because they've made the decision to medicate their symptoms instead of to take care of their health. And that's, that's the, really the fundamental problem of this whole thing is I think this virus would be far, far less dangerous if people actually on a mass scale took care of themselves. And that's part of what our mission is, is to help save 100 million lives, is to help get the information out there so that people can take preventative action before an emergency happens. Because when the emergency hits us, at that point it's too late. You can't get healthy before COVID you know, hits you. You, you, know, you can try. Uh, and you should be trying, but you know, if you took care of yourself on a regular basis, 
then we wouldn't necessarily all be in this boat of, of mass quarantine. Because again, you look at what's going to happen with mass quarantine is you're going to just completely wreck the economy. Now, some people would argue, yes, but one life is worth the economy. I would argue against that because when the economy goes south because of quarantines, it may not be 100% necessary. What you're going to end up creating is you're going to end up creating families whose entire savings and entire uh, financial uh, financial um, uh, savings are completely shot, are completely destroyed, and they're gone. You're going to create massive wide-scale depression. You're going to create massive wide-scale job loss. Anyway, I'm going to quit ranting on that because that's not what this show's about. But again, do your best to take care of yourself. That's the best defense that you have. There's no prediction as to whether or not this virus is going to hit you or whether it's not going to hit you. But the best thing that you can do is take control of your health today so that you can minimize your risk of getting sick. Okay, let's see here. NAC, somebody asked about NAC. Tracy uh, wanted to know about NAC. NAC, NAC, how much to take? 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams is a great kind of immune supporting dose. Uh, of course, if you, if you want to ramp that up and do a more aggressive use, you can take up to six grams a day, provided you're able to, your GI tract is able to tolerate it. And that would be in split dosing. So you can do you know, 1,000 milligrams at a time really, really easy over the course of six doses over the course of the day to gut tolerance. Okay, did we catch them all? I think the questions are just continuing to come, but we're at the, we're at the hour. So uh, I'll get a couple more. Rice, do you feel like quercetin in place of vitamin C is a good alternative for people with kidney stone or oxalate issues? Yeah, it can be because it won't, it won't increase the, the risk. It, again, it's, it's not exactly the same as vitamin C. It's different, but they share a lot of similar properties and effects. So Tracy wants to know, what should I give my kids um, to, to help support their immune systems right now? Um, Tracy, go back. We've got, I've got a whole video on my top vitamins, minerals that, that you should be considering for immune support. And that video is inclusive of children. Dwayne wants to know, best source of vitamin D? Uh, if we can put that up in the feed, it depends on whether you're trying to do high-dose vitamin D or whether you're trying to do you know maintenance. If you're trying to do high-dose vitamin D, Go to Gluten Free Society. There's a product called Ultra D3. And those are 50,000 unit pills. Um, if you're just trying to do maintenance vitamin D, there's another product called Liquid D3, which would be a better option because those are, you know, 1,000 international unit drops. So you could, you know, you could, you could use either one. But again, if you're trying to do the high dose stuff that I was talking about, a couple of weeks ago, you'll want to get that Ultra D3. Let's see here. Does MCT oil have the same effect as omega-3? No, it does not. It does not have the same effect as omega-3, not even close, not even in the same ballpark in terms of biochemical reactivity or impact or effect. Okay, what I'm going to encourage all of you to do is tune in again next week. I'm going to keep supporting you as we go through this thing, and I'm going to keep bringing new science and new information and new breaking stuff to you um, just as much as uh, you guys learn from me. I try to always come back to the table every week with something that, that I'm able to learn and something that I can add to this conversation to help you, to help your families get through this really challenging time. I wish you all the best. Again, if you're not already subscribed, hit that subscribe button. If you're on YouTube, if you're on Facebook, hit the... Uh, Hit the like, give me some hearts, show me some love. And as always, make sure you give me that hashtag, hashtag save 100 million lives and spell it out. It's not 1 million, it's not 10 million, it's 100 million lives. Hashtag that for me. That's the way we're going to spread this message and share this video with somebody you think could benefit from it. Look, we can help more people if we work together to help more people. And if we're all healthy, then the world's a better place. So again, wishing you excellent health. We'll see you next Monday for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Take care. Love you all. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure 
you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is going to allow us to remind you right before we go live. But it's also going to allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long, and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much, and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.